Well, welcome everybody uh, to our Thursday night weekly Western Victoria Matters conversation series. I might now turn to our second uh, panellist, Sanjeev Sablok, uh, who many of you would know from an article he wrote, uh, a very widely read one for the Australian Financial Review, uh, Why I Quit Rather Than Be Silenced. Uh, that was in regards to his time at the Victorian Treasury, uh, where he was until very recently uh, a senior economist, uh, Department of Treasury and Finance here uh, in Victoria. Uh, he resigned on uh, 9th of September 2020 after he was directed to remove his direct and indirect social media criticisms of the handling of the pandemic by some officials uh, of the Daniel Andrews Labor uh, government. Sanjeev, of course, has a book out, uh, The Great Hysteria and the Broken State, which is a fantastic read. It's just been published by Connor Court and I would commend it um, to you all. Sanjeev, thank you uh, for joining us this evening. Um, in terms of your time uh, in Treasury, as in the public service, and of course you uh, migrated here uh, from India, which gives you another unique uh, take, uh, give us a bit of an idea of uh, what your main concerns were uh, during your time in the public service under Daniel Andrews. You're just on mute, uh, Sanjeev, you're just on mute, sorry. Right. Uh, so I think uh, I have nothing against Daniel Andrews. Uh, in fact, I, as I mentioned in my book, uh, I actually voted for his uh, second term. Uh, I thought he had done a good job. Uh, so I, it's not about Daniel Andrews. Uh, it was about the uh, complete abandonment of all the good policies that I've been you know, familiar with over the past 15 years in Victoria, in the Treasury. Uh, in terms of risk-based analysis, uh, proportionality, uh, adequate uh, you know, consultation, uh, transparency of all the arguments and so on. So what happened is that uh, I actually later discovered after resigning, and, and this book has a lot of that because I, I did a fair bit of research in, in writing this book. Uh, I discovered that the Victorian pandemic plan, uh, which was published on the 10th of March uh, and was actually announced, I think, by Daniel Andrews was a very good plan. It had all the good elements of public policy that we have been used to. Uh, what then happened is that between that 10th of March and the end of March, the uh, something happened and I've got a chapter in my book trying to figure out what might've happened, which is probably the Neil Ferguson model and the hysteria created from that. That's why I call this the great hysteria. I think people, uh, just went blank uh, because all the good policies that were in place, they would have actually done, uh, you know, the, the flattening of the curve, managing the medical system, like you said. And, uh, you know, it, there was plenty of stuff in the, in the plan about educating the community and all the good things that you'd expect. And workplaces were supposed to be shut in a targeted way because our Public Health Act also is very precise in terms of how you shut down a workplace because it's a property right after all. So all the good policy was basically trashed and so I didn't really realize that it was in our pandemic plan, but I knew from my own work in 15 years in the treasury that this was not the way we were going to do this. And I had provided advice in writing and I've FOI'd that advice so I can then publish it, um, uh, but that was not my area. Uh, it's not that I was advising on pandemic policy, but it's our job as a collegiate organization to provide advice to our seniors about what we think is the right approach on any policy. And it's their job to then feed it to the right elements in the treasury. So it was not happening. Uh, there was a lot of uh, attempts I made to explain this uh, to a lot of people, it didn't happen. I've been writing articles in the Times of India. I, I wrote 17 articles in the last six months explaining this thing. Uh, I studied a lot of re, uh, you know, medical books and, uh, and uh, epidemiological books and virology books. So basically what happened is when I, was, uh, when I found that the police have started beating up people, that's when I became really concerned and I called it a police state. Uh, I started questioning the chief health officer for, for evidence about the use of masks outdoors, which I actually wear indoors. I'm very concerned about that. I've worn masks prior to the health officer requiring masks. Uh, so that's a different issue, but I'm risk-based, you know, talking about risk-based. So when the police started beating up, uh, that's when I, I guess my social media account started, you know, heating up. And that's when uh, I think the treasury uh, asked me, my senior, you know, uh, uh, executive, as well as the head of the people and culture to uh, remove, as you said, the tweets. And I decided on the, uh, virtually within 10 minutes of the meeting to act, to just go and to, to, to speak about this publicly. I'm very grateful that a lot of people have, you know, uh, 
been listening to my message. I'm trying to communicate what I think is basic core policy, public policy. It is our, it is embedded in our DNA in Victoria, which is the best in terms of the, you know, uh, we have the best governance system in the world. And for some godforsaken reason, we've we have just abandoned it. And, and that's the concern I express in my book. The stage four lockdowns, at least originally, were quite popular. The worm has turned over the last few weeks, for sure. Um, but I think a lot of Australians, I was surprised, I have to say, a lot of Australians were behind sort of the very heavy-handed lockdowns and even the, the fairly, what I would class as an overreach from law enforcement. Um, and I've been a bit taken aback by a lot of people's willingness to go along um, with the measures and the so-called experts. Um, my question to the panel is, what does this, what, what has this lockdown um, revealed about who we are as a country and about our culture? Um, that's something I'm very interested in, I think is important. Maybe Sanjeev, if I could um, start with you on that one. Uh, well, then this has been a, a complete shock to me. Um, I've expressed that, you know, in my book as well and a number of places fact that uh, all institutions in Australia, so uh, what I have argued in my uh, lecture, uh, my presentation to the Samuel Griffith so uh, Society the, the, uh, last week was that um, a, a common law uh, you know, based uh, country like ours without a bill of rights in the constitution, we depend upon the functioning of all institutions and that includes by the way, the citizens, but I also would like to emphasize institutions like the media and the uh, you know the, the the representatives of the of the people, and uh, the business sector, and and essentially what we've seen is a complete uh, you know shutting down of the debates on from all uh, from all angles from all sides. Uh, in fact, somebody asked me a question in the interview yesterday. Uh, I had an interview with somebody else, and <clears throat> their question was, "Why do you think the media has not carried much criticism of <clears throat> or even analysis of these policies?" And to me, that was the basic question, really. And I thought, and I think I've addressed it to, a, to an extent uh, in my in my book. And I think that also gets back to the question about Daniel Andrews, you know, personal character or whatever. And I have nothing against anybody here. I believe all people are good people, and all they've done is they've gone into a you know, hysterical mode. So, you know, when you flip your lid, as they say, your, your, your frontal lobe stops working. <clears throat> and that's, once it happens, it's pretty hard to get it back. And it seemed to have happened for all of a vast swathe of institutions. The people, by the way, all over the world have been so badly scared that the polls, not I think in Australia, but in Germany, in Sweden, in England and other countries, they've actually showed that people has, have, been reporting deaths in their mind of about 7% of the population, 7% or 8%. They're talking of hundreds of times more in their mind, the people, uh, you know, they think that they've died, whereas actually there are 13 out of 100,000, one out of 7594. Now the, uh, the hysteria, and this is not new, this is not the first time it's happened, but it's for the first time it's happened on such a global scale. And there are a lot of factors that came in, you know, it's like, no accident happens unless seven or eight or nine things fail, and then a major you know, aircraft accident might happen. Likewise, here, a number of institutions fail at the same time. And that's the whole analysis for a future Royal Commission. But I think your point about uh, the, the people taking it, I think the people were just made very scared. That's as simple as that. Yeah, no, I think, that, I think that's a big part of it. If you look at every, every day on the front page, it was the number of new cases uh, that were emerging, not reporting, you know, recovery rate or fatality rate or any other sort of measures that are relevant. And as you say, people were you know, very scared. Um, there, uh, Sanjeev, uh, what do you uh, think about how do we get through this? How do we keep the hope alive of our freedoms? What can we do to well, work together? Well, then I'm not waiting for anything else. Uh, I've, uh, you know, sacrificed my job and I'm here to make this happen. So the difference between an academic analysis and my analysis is that I'm exercising my rights as a sovereign citizen. I've started a liberatevictoria.org website in which I've got a strategy. We're working together, the legal cases that are going on. I'm working with uh, you know, a, a team of wonderful people who are doing great things. Uh, I think the collaboration that I'm looking for now is of those people who want freedom please join this little Google group that I've got. Uh, there are a number of excellent people that we are well connected with. I'm working practically 18 hours a day. And uh, the goal here is to spread the message to the people through my book I've done, through the, you know, the, the uh, nine, ch uh, 
Channel 9 program the other day and so on and so forth. I've given 15 interviews. I'm basically explaining to people that number one, this is not a big deal. This is definitely nowhere in the league of Spanish flu. It's a little bit bigger than the normal flu. It's, a, it's in the range of uh, the Asian flu and the Hong Kong flu, which were relatively uh, minor or moderate pandemics. So first of all, get ourselves unhysterical. And I think everyone can contribute by looking at the data, which Gigi mentioned, and it's available publicly. And I've actually got it in the book. It's written so many places. It's a common sense thing. So once we get unhysterical, we need to understand that we, each of us is fully capable. And I think I, I cite the Swedish model uh, repeatedly. The, each of us can be trusted. And I think that trust point that was raised by Gigi is so critical. The government has, 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 ex, has displayed what uh, Friedrich Hayek has called the fatal conceit that it can actually fix every single thing on, on earth. You know, like uh, David also mentioned that, you know, it's throwing packages and so on at people. Well, actually a complex society, like a, uh, an economy requires all kinds of factors, you know, the agglomeration effect, the collaboration, the competition, the whole thing is such a complicated exercise. And that requires the state to play a very minimal role. The idea that the state is playing such a dominant role today by throwing packages, you know, paying the workers, shutting down this business, that business, creating the most absurd rules. I cannot even try to describe the absurdity of the rules being cooked up by these extraordinarily conceited public servants. So what, we are, what I'm trying to do is to basically just fight back. I'm, I'm not here to take this line down. I have taken this line down for six months. And then I think I've come out and I think I've got to really get this fixed. So I'm actually act operating as a political citizen at this stage, a single one man political citizen. I, anybody who wants to join, fight with me, get ourselves liberated, li liberate Victoria and, and, and get the people unhysterical and get the government to implement its own laws. And I've shown in the book that they have broken all the laws of Victoria. They have the transparency issue that David mentioned. There is no disclosure of what they've been doing. There's no justification because they're all rubbish. All these justifications will be tossed out in the court in two seconds. This is the biggest pile of crap that they are implementing at the moment in Victoria. There's no justification whatsoever. And I know that there's none because in my book, I've explained that lockdowns were banned by the World Health Organization. They are, they are rejected outright by scientific papers. There's not a single peer reviewed paper in the history of the world prior to the Wuhan lockdowns that actually said that lockdowns are going to do any good. And there are so many papers that have come out since then that said lockdowns have done nothing as we expected. So we are saying that this has got no benefit. Forget about the idea of a potential saving of life. This actually cost us lives because they did not focus on the elderly, which is what the original plan was going to do. So what we've got is a terribly distorted and broken government. I call it the broken state, the broken government. We need the government to get its act together. We need the public servants, people like my secretary of the Department of Treasury, who should have actually used all the possible advice. And I can tell you there are a lot of economists within the Treasury who are dramatically concerned about what's going on. This is not how econ economists work. So, you know, the, the whole idea of uh, collaboration, this is just... the. the the shambles that we have today. I think that shambles needs to be fixed by all of us coming together to fight for our freedoms and to fight for the, for the implementation of our laws in Victoria, which are really, really good. Thanks, Sanjeev. Dave, uh, experts, and Kyle asks, uh, what are the views of the panel on the various federal and state emergency legislation which seem to enable governments to shed decision-making and responsibility through to uh, unelected experts slash specialists. Uh, and then the follow-up question, should the balance be changed to protect democracy? I would say absolutely, it must be changed. Uh, but I would say that ever since the lockdowns were first imposed in March and April, um, we only ever had one type of expert, which is the health expert that would stand up there with the prime minister or the premier. There was never anyone there to talk about economic impacts, social impacts, cultural impacts, institutional impacts. It was only one expert um, that was ever there standing with um, politicians at the podium, which I think was a big, big uh, problem. Uh, Sanjeev, uh, given your experience in um, the public service, what's your view? Do you, I know some people aren't, you know, they, they might say, well, we need to have lots of a lot of experts. They play an important role. Other people, you know, such as myself, are a bit more skeptical of it. Where do you uh, land on this? So, Daniel, I've uh, uh, the last chapter of my book, I've got about 12, I think about 10 or 12 recommendations. Uh, one of them I've been arguing from the middle of uh, roughly the middle of uh, August. 
after seeing uh, the horrendous mess created by the emergency powers. And also, by the way, the precautionary principle, which to me is the most deadly piece of ammunition. It's like a bomb planted inside your body. And I've, I think that's stayed in almost all legislation that needs to go. But the emergency power, by the way, in Sweden, I studied this matter and it was very obvious that Sweden is actually not only led by the world's greatest uh, epidemiologist, he's got the most enormous experience in terms of you know, infectious disease. So he's a great scientist and he's a doctor, uh, very concerned about this pe uh, you know, people. But also the Swedish constitution, I had a close look at it. It only allows a declaration of emergency in the case of declaration of a war. And therefore, the, there's no possibility whatsoever of uh, uh, any such mass you know, increase in powers of mass closure of work downs, workplaces, and so on. So yes, I think from the middle of August, and I've written on the Catalexy files initially, uh, Times of India article as well. And in the book, I've argued this is the, I think, probably, probably the first item that we should ensure that there is no power anywhere in Australia, whether in the Commonwealth or in the States, for an emergency declaration, except in the time of war. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the first part. And the second part, uh, I think I, I mentioned the precautionary principle, which is, which is probably worse than, by the way, a declaration of emergency. It actually officially requires you to abandon your reasoning. It says you are not required to have any reason to do whatever you think you want to do. And that's the summary of that, uh, of that principle for those who are not familiar with it. I'm very familiar with that. I've been fighting against its damage to Victoria's, uh, by the way, when I say it's a well-governed state, I only give it eight out of 10. When I was in the treasury, we were fighting for, against things of the sort where reckless decisions have been taken in a number of policy areas. I won't go into that on the basis of the precautionary principle. So that should go which leads us finally to the, the, the concept of experts. And as you know, the, the point you raised here, then is very important. The government, by the way, we have is a West, Westminster model. It's not a star chamber. I've said that today we've been running the crisis council of cabinet equal to what I call the star chamber. There is absolutely no transparency. And I've briefed on a number of submissions to the triple uh, C but they were not related to the particular pandemic health policy. But the idea of short circuiting the cabinet process, which I think uh, the, the, the health minister also had flagged as a, as a significant concern, uh, has been a, a complete you know, a, a loss, has, has helped, has ensured that we lost all the relevant expertise around the table. In a, cabinet, in, a, in a Westminster model, all kinds of expertise is brought to bear on every single policy. And I suspect this, what's happened here, I, I'm, I'll be writing an open letter to the secretary of my department, I will not be writing by name, but as an institution, I want to know whether he was, he advised our treasurer about all these trade-offs because as economists, we, act, we are the repository. There are a hundred of us in the treasury and we are paid a good amount of money, a few million dollars by the taxpayers to provide the government with independent advice on every single policy. And if that was not done by our, tre our treasurer and he started behaving like a ministerial advisor instead, then he needed to take a pay cut because he gets $700,000, which is more than the premier salary and the ministerial advisors get $150,000. And if he's only acting as a ministerial advisor, not as the secretary, then he needs to take a pay cut. I'll, I'll be writing about that. But if he did advise, and I want him to then publish through FOI, all that advice that he provided, because really there is no, there is not a single policy which we call, by the way, in the, in the treasury, I explained to Peter Credlin in my first interview with her on Sky News, there are two central agencies in every government, the, the premier and cabinet and the treasury. These are central agencies. We actually do not have the line agency expertise. So if it's a health policy, then that's a line agency policy. And that's an expertise, we fully respect that. But then it comes to these other people that the premier's cabinet has a lot of expertise in international law, in the, in the you know, indigenous uh, you know, uh, laws and practices, culture and, and so social impacts. And our, uh, you know, the treasury has a lot of expertise on economic impacts. And so all these impacts are fed into the cabinet process. And there's a collaborative discussion, the cabinet, the Westminster model works and therefore we land at the best possible decision. In this particular case, we've had one line agency, the DHHS dictating policy. And I think I've asked the FOI uh, from my department, which will act, I'll publish as soon as I get it, where they've actually asked me to, actually told me in writing 
that this matter uh, of pandemic policy, et cetera, is, is only a matter for the DHHS. And I disagree completely with the idea that there is anything in the world that is only the uh, ambit of a particular expert in the cabinet uh, and the Westminster model. And that's why I call this an institution that's based on the common law and the old Magna Carta model. We have to work collaboratively. And that collaborative uh, system, if it had work functioned, uh, none of this would have happened. I've also got many other recommendations I won't go into at this sta uh, stage for shortage of time yet. Thank you, Sanjeev. I think this is one of the very most significant issues. And I would just add a little bit to that and then go to the panel, which was one of the things I've never understood is we were told 1.5 meter social distancing, right? That was, that was the advice. I don't know, I'll take their word for 1.5 meters. I don't know where it came from, but I'll, I'll take them at their word. But then on top of the 1.5, we had a whole plethora of restrictions on specific activities that could have been undertaken with the 1.5 meter social distancing. So either it's 1.5 meters or it's not. And I've had a hard time understanding, well, why, why have the 1.5 meter rule and then say we're going to have a whole list of specific things that you can and cannot do, um, which is something that I've found to be quite confusing throughout the whole um, uh, period. Uh, Sanjeev, I might just start uh, with you on uh, this particular uh, question about what do you make of uh, the what seems to be uh, restrictions on activities that are pretty tenuously related to public health concerns? I think all of us have alluded to this issue a number of times already. And I think the issue there was that... Uh, if they had followed the original pandemic plan, by the way, the first thing I mentioned in my book, and I think that's everybody will understand it's common sense. Pandemics are not, the, this is not the first pandemic in the history of the world. Uh, we have them regularly. They come every 30 years on average. Uh, the big ones come once a hundred years or something. And so this was a one in 30 year kind of thing. And uh, that's what our assessment was in the, on 10th of March. It is a moderate level pandemic. That's what they had said, which is absolutely accurate. And, uh, by the way, there is a massive amount of planning going on for pandemics in the government. The government, the public service is actually a very talented pool of people. The doctors, you know, the, 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 the economists, the lawyers, and the whole lot of experts who advise on these plans. So the plan actually was very sensible and it would never have allowed, and it would have ensured a very targeted thing. Like, you know, we had the example of, uh, what, what, what's that, uh, you know, the, the shutting down of a uh, building for, what is that disease called? Legi Legionella? Legionnaire's disease, yeah. Legionnaire's disease. And so that's a very specific thing. And remember, the, the public health law requires the, the, the details of the, uh, uh, the reasons to be published. It, it, is a, it, force, it actually says the chief health officer shall not uh, impose any arbitrary order. So what we're seeing here is a 100% arbitrary orders. And if we had just followed our own pandemic plan, which did not have any lockdown, there was no mention of lockdown, 23 hour curfews, uh, five kilometer radius you know, uh, limits, uh, whatever, all the crap that we're seeing so far, not a single of them is in our actual the plan. Lockdown is so killing what, what, the economy and people. Sorry, yes. So what, what we basically have in Victoria is the most arbitrary set of uh, policies that have been imposed uh, by our chief health officer and I think the whole bunch of experts. And I, I suspect the Royal Commission is absolutely urgently needed to, to, uh, to understand why this happened. And I suspect, as David had mentioned, that the precautionary principle will, be com will come out as the you know, excuse. And I, I would argue that we should, as Victorians and as Australians, abolish the preca precautionary principle because this gives everybody an out. And so they can go to the court and say, sorry, we did it as a precaution. But where did the precaution come from? It's in my head. Like, you know, oh, we want to keep the overall level under control. And so there is no reasoning allowed, required under the precautionary principle. And that is the most deadly thing that they have in the Public Health Act, as well as in many other acts in Victoria. So overall, I think what we're seeing is absolutely arbitrary orders. Uh, Dan, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't find, because I've done a lot of science uh, background. I've got a science background, a massive study of all these issues, 17 articles on the topic uh, in the last six months. There is not a single uh, uh, measure, public health measure in Victoria in the last six months that is justified by the science. Yeah, thanks, thanks Sanjeev. Um... That's pretty concerning if you couldn't find any. No, <laughs> not a single. <laughs> uh, great. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Juji, and thank you, Sanjeev. And thank you, everybody, for attending and for your active participation. Great discussion. And I will throw back uh, to Bev for some concluding remarks. Thank you, Bev. Well, thank you, Daniel. You've been an outstanding moder moderator. And haven't we had a, a sweet uh, of experts tonight who've uh, abandoned the precautionary principle and uh, 
uh, told you exactly how it is. We've heard about the splitting of society between those that are in a job effectively and those who are not in a job, and especially the public service area who are in a very well-paid job and they even got a pay rise. Um, we've, we've talked about the cost of lockdowns and the unseen costs of lockdowns. And, and those include the fact that many people have not presented to doctors and hospitals uh, for, for treatment, preventative health treatment, the costs of which will be immense as we go down uh, the path of uh, finding out that people do have uh, complaints that should have been treated uh, way earlier. We've, we've, we've talked about how we can come out of this. Well, I'm always the glass half full girl uh, and I only see opportunities, not problems. And I'd like to think that we now have a greenfield site that we can actually develop a far better way of doing government in this country than we've ever done before. We've got to take the lessons as David and uh, our panelists have said about the overreach of government. We do have to jealously guard our liberties and freedoms. Um, and we've got to demand transparency and accountability of government. Uh, we've got to release this hysteria uh, and, and put an end to it. And we've, we've got to get trust back into government. We've lost that. Government's lost our trust. Uh, remember, governments can't fix problems. Only individuals can. And uh, the, the, the problem with uh, government is that politicians are busy about getting re-elected. You know, I'm from the government. I'll buy your vote with your money, mind you. So beware of the politician bearing gifts, I, I always say. We, we do have some ridiculous rules and regulations and I've talked about some in the last couple of days in Parliament like David hasn't. The other day we've just we've just issued an edict that children can't sing in kindergartens here in Victoria. Um, you know we, we've we've got in, in my area in Western Victoria there's barely a case there's be, in some areas there's been no cases in my 24 local government municipalities we're closer to South Australia in many areas than we are to Melbourne, where you can dance at weddings in South Australia, but you can't sing in kindergartens in Victoria. Um, and so we, you know, we, we, we've stopped people going to churches. Now, they naturally social distance because in many churches there aren't many people going. So uh, there's plenty of distance, I would have thought, but, you know, in rural Victoria, you can, you can go to a pub, but you can't go to a church. They're total hypocrisies and and inequities in the, the whole thing. Uh, the, uh, I've said today in Parliament that we'll have a, a real emergency on our hands and it'll be a fire emergency because right now people in Melbourne, if they've got a property outside of Melbourne, they can't even go and do fire prevention. So we'll, we'll, we'll have a bushfire emergency soon uh, because we've had a fantastic season, lots of rain, there's lots of growth, uh, yet people can't do fire prevention because of it's not safe to move, move out and it's not considered essential. Uh, Sanjeev talked about needing a Royal Commission. And today, of course, was an anniversary of the unfortunate anniversary of the collapse of the uh, Westgate Bridge and the loss of lives. Well, immediately Henry Bolte called for a Royal Commission. I think there were 30 lives lost. Is that right, David? Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, well, we've, I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but yeah. yes, it was a significant loss of life. Yeah, so um, under 50 anyway. Well, we've, we've actually killed 800 people here in Victoria. Nobody seems to remember how it happened, who's responsible. I can't recall. They don't read emails. Uh, so we badly, I, I think, need a Royal Commission to find out exactly who's responsible. And in the omnibus bill the other day in committee, my first question to the minister was, which minister brought to this bill the idea that we'd have authorised officers? Well, after about a quarter of an hour of questioning, we couldn't get an answer. Well, it was a collective cabinet decision where we, you know, so nobody, I said, I'm just trying to save you money here. We've spent nearly six million on, on an inquiry to find out who was responsible for hotel quarantine. I don't want to spend another six million trying to find out who decided we'd have authorised officers in this state. 
but we they could not get an answer out of the minister on this particular point. And this is the problem we've got with this uh, crisis cabinet that was set up, as Sanjeev has explored, where there is no collective advice and decision making that happens in in normally in a in a cabinet where everybody sits around with advisors and you know errors that have occurred and decisions that are made would never have happened in a normal Westminster cabinet system. Going forward, I think we need to, to we it, it, in this world of opportunity, I hope we'll have after this is we need to redefine the roles of the three levels of government. What are they specifically needed to do? How can we reduce the level of duplication, administration, regulation? And I think what we do have to have in, in government in this country, uh, especially in this state, is we need to have an outcomes column in the spreadsheet. If the program does not deliver an outcome, it should be scrapped. Uh, that would actually reduce a lot of activity in government. Uh, if we, we looked at what are they actually delivering? at what cost, for what benefit, and does it serve a purpose? If it doesn't, it goes. Um, so there is, there's a, a lot that we could do to make this better. Certainly David and I and uh, our colleagues uh, will fight to ensure that freedoms are restored. Uh, this government does uh, answer the questions that are so vitally needed to find out how this happened and why it should never happen again. And that's the most important thing I think we can do to ensure that we never get into a situation where we have basically a dictatorship uh, running our state. And we only have to look at the other states where 14 cases in New South Wales today, six in Victoria, they're not in lockdown, masks aren't compulsory, the world's going on, uh, the economy's uh, back in operation, shops are open here. Uh, we've pursued this strategy of elimination and the costs, as Gigi said, are enormous. They're going to be enormous uh, uh, monetarily wise, but in, in a human sense as well. So, look, I thank everybody again for this, this wonderful presentation that they've given tonight. I thank the audience for joining us again.